Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I'm part of the English faculty here at Brookdale, as well as the director of the Creative Writing Program. Today, I am very excited to have on the show um, multiply talented <laughs> author Paul Lisicki, who has written Lawn Boy, Famous Builder, The Burning House, and most recently, a gorgeous book called Unbuilt Projects. So, Paul, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thanks, Suzanne. It's great nice to be here. I'm excited. So you have written a novel, mm -hmm. a novella, mm -hmm. short prose pieces, prose poems, a memoir, poetry, and when I was reading up on you on the web, I also found out that you used to compose music as right, well, too. Right, right. Now, most writers stick to one genre of it <laughs> and make forays into other ones. Um, and you don't. You don't. Um, so I'm wondering what your relationship to, to genre is and sort of the the boundaries or delineations between them. Right. I mean, these these movements through different genres are not calculated. Um, I went to grad school as a fiction writer, and I expected to be writing one novel after the next. And um, after I'd published my first novel, I was quite aware that the next novel could, in fact, have been something really close in form to that novel. Mm -hmm. um, I was aware of the problem of simply simply writing another version of that book and substituting the place names with other place names, the character mm -hmm. names with other character names. So. Um, it seemed interesting to me to tear down what I had learned in the first novel and do something completely different, which was mm -hmm. to write um, a memoir in a voice that was radically different from the voice of the first novel, which was sort of edgy and volatile and slippery. And I thought, well, you know, what would happen if I wrote um, some of the, the, the stories of my youth and um, used a voice that, that, that had some distance from that other voice. So mm. I think of the voice of Famous Builder as being much warmer. This is the memoir. This is the yeah. memoir. I think of that, that voice as being warmer and more available, more uh -huh. silly, uh, more playful. This was not... This was not something, I mean, that sounds like I, I deliberated or willed this. I, after the first book, I, I just started playing around. I, I mm -hmm. didn't feel so much pressure um, to publish right away. And I was experimenting and ended up writing a piece about my childhood next door neighbor. And mm -hmm. I was interested in that voice and just wanted to keep pushing it, so. Now, was this so often second books are really authors' first books that had right. been in the drawer for a while right. until they got the first one published? Had you been writing memoir or essays beforehand? No, no, that's yeah. what was sort of thrilling to me hmm. about it because in grad school, I, I, thought, of, I thought of nonfiction as, um, a territory that I wasn't interested in at mm -hmm. all. You know, it, when I went to grad school, you could either be, and this was, you know, I finished in 1990, so my graduate program is more yeah. or less divided between poets and fiction writers. Yeah. And there was a nonfiction program on campus, but it wasn't housed in the same department. So, <laughs> they weren't allowed in the building. Well, I, so I thought, like, well, why, why would anyone want to write nonfiction? You can't, I mean, I was interested in making something up. I was interested yeah. in escaping my own experience. Uh -huh. And, you know, I didn't realize back then that nonfiction offers so many different, you know, so many different leaps mm -hmm. and opportunities for, for imagination. So, um, I essentially wrote um, Famous Builder as an amateur, learning my way mm -hmm. into a form. And I think that's been, the approach for each of these books. I find out how to do something yeah. and I sort of tear down what I know in order to write the next book. There, there's something really thrilling to me mm. about um, writing into the unknown, making, trying to make art out of something I don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. Is, now, how does poetry fit into this? Because you're talking about fiction and, and, and nonfiction, memoir. Right. But you're also a poet as well, too. Right. Does that feel like a different impulse then? Or? No, I, I, you know, I think my own fiction, I, I write fiction like a poet. You know, I, you I'm interest, I always start with image. I'm interested in metaphor. I'm interested in compression. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the sound of language. Mm -hmm. And um, those things are... Um, 
in the foreground to me. I, I think of character and story, theme, all that stuff is subordinate, and that, yeah. that comes later. So I think I've, I've always been a poet who just needed a little bit more room on the page. <laughs> or I've, I've been someone Give who has Give me a few a, more words, <laughs> come on. Or I've been someone who's um, not, um, not terribly interested in you know, following the conventions of any particular genre. For me, energy happens when I'm writing something that lives on the borders between two genres. Mm. Well, I think I'm, I am gonna ask you if you would read the, just the start to Unbuilt Projects, then, sure. that, that first paragraph, which is, is so beautiful, and I think it's a okay. great example of what Thanks. you're just talking about with, I mean, I always really love, we had uh, Tim O'Brien here once um, from, you know, the things they carried. And one of the things I love about his work and that I love about your work is, I'm about to insult all prose writers here, which I don't <laughs> mean to do, but just a prose writer you can see is really paying attention to language mm -hmm. at a word level and the music in it, um, which I think is rare. Thanks. I think it's rare. So okay. would you? Sure. This is um, the opening of a piece called Palo Alto. Maybe it was a smell of cough drop on the air, and the trees, eucalyptus, birch, palm, redwood, side by mm. side in one space. It might have been the thinking inside the houses I passed, minds at work over desks, fingers tapping keys, tapping foreheads. Maybe it was the nearness of the sea, and the mountain between the highway and the sea, levels inside landscape, inside moments, wholeness the lie we always suspected it was, and we could finally get down to this business of motion, of making ourselves up again. I ran faster than I'd ever run before. <coughs> My feet flew over this pavement and that. I went all the way past the stable, and when I took that shortcut past the schoolyard, the children inside with their tom-toms, I thought of what they'd be when they were running past these windows. Oh, that's beautiful. Thanks. That's absolutely Thanks. beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to get my coffee back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it begins with language for you then? Mm -hmm. yeah. It begins with sound. I mean, yeah. my, my first um, foray into making art was as a musician, as you mm. took note of before, as, was as a composer. So I think- And do you play instruments as, or sing I, as well I too? Do, uh, I'm not a very good singer. I think yeah. that I have a much better voice inside my head, but the voice <laughs> that comes out is- <laughs> It's never satisfactory to me. I have a really impeccable sense of phrasing in my imagination, and I, I don't phrase well um, when you know when I'm singing on the spot. But I'm I I, I love I'm, I'm so much interested in doing what I can to capture the cadence of my voice mm -hmm. in this work, and um, that is my first. Um, my first guide, you know, it, it has to sound, sound. It, it has to sound faithful. It has to sound accurate mm -hmm. to the sound of my own speech patterns. So I, I'm essentially talking a lot of this stuff out as I'm writing it mm -hmm. and trying out certain lines and, and giving up on certain lines. And mm -hmm. the work over the years has become much more, much more musical than, um, th than, image-based. I mean, there are images in the work, obviously, but but the sound has to be accurate first and foremost. Hmm. Hmm. And you think you, you know, this brings you right back to your early, earlier years as a musician. Yeah, I, mean, I think I'm composing. trying to, it's, I'm trying to do what I can to, mm -hmm. to bring that lost musician back into my work. You do, know, you, do you still compose or play? What instrument? I, Did you I play instruments? A, yeah, I, um, keyboards and yeah. guitar, and yeah. I haven't touched them in years. And there's still something painful to me about that. But, um, you know, I, I'm attempting to write a kind of figurative harmony on the page. I'm interested yeah. in writing work that speeds up and slows down, that expands and contracts and does everything I'd want it to be if, if it were, in fact, a piece of music. Mm -hmm. Do you listen to music a lot while yeah. you're writing? A, a little bit while I'm writing. It has yeah. to be the right music, and it has to be the right spirit. Somewhere, I forget which website it was, but there was a soundtrack, I think, to The Burning House. Yes, that? oh, that's um, from Large Hearted Boy. Yeah. That's a great, um, a great website. The, the guy, um, David Gutkowski, uh -huh. who curates that, asks various writers to contribute um, playlists 
that mirror yeah. mirror their book, not not literally in terms of content, but figuratively. So. And who was on? I don't remember who was on the Burning House playlist. Oh, man, I've done I've done about three playlists. Oh, you have? Oh, actually, yeah. I, there are four of them. There are four um, playlists for unbuilt projects on Spotify. So they've all oh, wow. sort of um, compressed in my mind. You know, I think there was a Radiohead song on. Um, for the burning house, I think it was Jigsaw out of place. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Uh, Jeff Buckley. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of. A, was it a fun to of, do? It was huge fun. <laughs> that was my favorite one to do. Yeah. Because I, I, I really was conscious of using those voices, thinking about Jeff Buckley's voice mm -hmm. and his spirit and his intensity when yeah. I was writing the voice of that book. Well, I wish we could have we could have swelling music to take us out right now, but we can't. <laughs> but we do have to take a break. Okay. So we're going to take a break. Please Great. come back, and I'm talking with Paula Sicki. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> part isn't always waking up exhausted with legs that feel like lead or that my memory is shot and every muscle in my body is screaming the worst part isn't even that everyone thinks the problems in my head the worst part of chronic fatigue syndrome is missing my life cfs affects more than one million americans get informed get diagnosed get help Saving lives in the world's poorest countries. Winning the fight against global AIDS and extreme poverty. There aren't two sides to these issues. There is only one. Please vote. One.org. Here are the low monthly payments and interest rate as we promised. Here's where they triple. The rest of this is really just here so that we get your house when you can't pay us back. Predatory lenders are never this easy to spot. Call us and protect yourself with the facts. can provide the support you need to reduce your risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Eat right and get active. Hi, and welcome back to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm here talking with Paul Lasicki, author of, most recently, Unbuilt Projects. Um, so before the, the break, we were talking kind of about your relationship to genres and kind of ignoring boundaries. And right. Just making it be what it is. Um, 
I do wonder if you consider yourself primarily one type of writer, though. Do you? Are you a fiction writer or a poet or a, a prose writer? That's such a good question. <laughs> you're going to say no. <laughs> just be done with it. Well, I, I don't want to say. I, I think if I just say no, it, it sounds too easy. <laughs> and um, oh, man. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know if I can answer it. <laughs> I, I, Is know, there one that you feel most comfortable in that, that happens you know, most it, easily you know, for it you? It depends upon what's going on in, in mm. my life. and in, in you know, It depends on my psychic material at a time. Mm -hmm. I actually I'm, I have a memoir coming out next year. And mm -hmm. um, after I finished that memoir, I couldn't do any, any more autobiographical mm. nonfiction work for a while. So... I wrote a series of, of fictional pieces that are pretty much based around the forms of parable and fable. Hmm. And um, that seemed truest to my own urgency at that point. And I hmm. think I've sort of tapped out that vein now and I'm going back to revise the memoir mm -hmm. and feeling really engaged in, in that voice. I mean, all mm. of these voices are constructions. Sure. And, you know, the voice of the memoir is, is you know, closer to my own experience, but I, I think they're all emotionally autobiographical. Mm -hmm. So I always think of, of, of writing or talk about all the different roles we have in our lives that, you know, I'm, I'm right. daughter, I'm partner, I'm teacher, I'm shop clerk, I'm in, you know, which voice are you speaking from in exactly. this narrative? You can't tell your whole story. That's right, not a memoir. Right. And I think the project of my work has yeah. been an attempt to, to get to get a version of the whole story down, the the, the multiple versions so of like me on the page. So it's like a Rubik's cube. It's like yeah. okay, I'm going to switch this side now. Right. And this I mean, side. because there there are um, common threads. There are. I mean, there's an interest yeah. in building. There's a fascination with identity, mm -hmm. um, fascination with music. And also seems for home. sort of that the connection and the community right. also seems to run through as well. It's interesting you said that because you've got your first book was Lawn Boy, right? So maybe not so much, but then you've got Famous Builder, The Burning House, and Unbuilt Projects. Yeah. I mean, just in the titles, it seems like these books are speaking to one another, right? I and mean, were it, you were you intentionally doing a a building house building? I wanted to be a builder as a kid. Seriously, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't playing around. That was, you know, that was my first work as an artist, really. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, my parents re really respected that quirky kid who, who came home from school, didn't do his homework, and who took out a piece of poster board and started designing cities. So, oh, wow. Um, and I think my interest in language probably came from the names I was applying to streets and parks and boulevards and wow. lakes. And, um, you know, I, I was playing around with the textures of words when, mm -hmm. I, was, when I was involved in those projects. So... I like the fact that there is some consistency in metaphor, at least in title, from book to book to book. But it, it really wasn't anything I willed early on. Yeah. Um, most of the books, in fact, have had another title and then sort of come back to come something back to that's, that figures into that architecture, home-building lens. Do you still have some of those poster boards with your cities on them? I do, do yeah. That's Actually, the, the cover of Famous Builder, which we don't have, oh, it yeah. is a little piece from one of those. Oh, is like, it? Thank God my parents saved some of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. That bottom drawer of the desk. It's right, like, or you. something in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, I wonder as well, as you're sort of thinking about themes and the like. In an interview, and I have to look down because I don't have this off the top of my head, you had said that you were obsessed with the question of where do we begin and end? Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of talk about that? And is that something that you're still thinking about in your work? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm obsessed with the question of identity mm -hmm. and whether we're singular in this life or whether our, ident our identity is dependent upon the people around us, the people we love. Is it dependent upon where we live, mm -hmm. how we live? Um, I think I've lived so many different lives by this point and, and mm -hmm. so, many, you know, so many different contexts, so many different places. And I've, I've been aware of my own shifting identity over the years. So mm -hmm. 
Um, I have no answers to that, but um, it, I, I keep coming back to that essential question: like, what What does yeah. it mean? What does it mean to be a self? Um, yeah. You know. Is that what writing is for you, in part? Uh, I hate to say figuring out, because that makes it sound very much like therapy, which yeah, I don't and, mean. And, and there's and as if there's an answer at the other yeah. end. But, but yeah, I mean, I think it is a, an attempt to to put some stakes in the ground, mm -hmm. even though the ground might be shifting all the time. Mm. You know, I, I, I um, yeah, I think I sort of need to say figuratively who I am at any given moment with mm -hmm. the hope that the reader is going to participate in that project. Hmm. You know, the project isn't just for me, obviously. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in writing something that's self-enclosed and impenetrable. Yeah. I, I yeah. Was, I'm, I'm assuming that we all, we all share this concern. We all share this obsession. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, so much comes at us from the culture. We're always being told how to dress, how to talk, mm -hmm. how to be, what to want, what looks successful. And mm -hmm. you know, I, it, how could you not be in some resistance or some struggle with all that stuff that's, mm -hmm. that's hitting us from outside? So, mm. um, yeah, I think part of part of the project of this is is to maybe develop my own sense of self attunement, huh. which is interesting because in unbuilt projects. Um, which are these, I think it's called short prose pieces, yeah? Yeah. Now, is this a memoir or is this fiction? Fictionalized well, some of those, memoir? Some of, those pieces, <laughs> some of those pieces were published as poems and yeah. magazines, some as lyric essays and some as stories. Um, Would you define a, a lyric essay for us? A lyric essay is an essay that um, wants to wants to test or try, as all essays do, testing out a notion. Mm -hmm. It's based around an inquiry. But formally, it has something in common with a poem. Mm -hmm. So it's typically organized ar around a metaphor. Um, it's often interested in, in breaks between mm -hmm. sections, mm -hmm. the way a poem is. And I think of the individual sections of a lyric essay as having some correspondence with a stanza mm -hmm. in a poem. So, and it's interested in sound, the sound yeah. of the language. Yeah. Well, would you would you describe the book? I, I'm going to ask you to do that because I think it's a hard book to describe. So I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> describe the book. Um, um, yeah. A series of questions about identity and memory. The, the yeah. book started out of necessity back in 2006, I believe. I, I visited my parents in Florida and was sitting down with my mother for breakfast. And in the middle of a very calm breakfast, she said, you almost seem like my son. Oh. And I said back to her, well, I am your son. And then she said, well, you almost seem like my twin brother. Mm. And I said, but mom, I'm your son. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of a rupture in her own memory, mm -hmm. you know, what, we, what was later diagnosed as dementia. Mm -hmm. and that felt like the most disturbing point in my life in, in mm -hmm. that um, the, you know, the center of our household wa was, was beginning to shred. And mm -hmm. there was something about that situation that led me to ask questions of everything I thought I knew yeah. about narrative, about character, about wholeness, about time where we mm. begin or end. Mm. So um, I wanted to take, I needed to take my work back down to the basics because mm -hmm. uh, the language that I assumed w that was reliable wasn't anymore. Mm. So I, I did not, yeah. I, I wrote each piece as if I was walking into the dark and trying to make sense. Did of you what know that they next. were going to be linked together in a book? No. 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 I mean, I always, of course, one always has that hope, but yeah. I, I think if I'd had that notion from the get-go, it would have been overdetermined. Yeah. You well, know, it's an absolute, it, it truly is an absolutely beautiful well, book. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, you know, as lyric essays, as poetry, as 
a narrative as well, too. Um, I yeah, mean, there, works, there is a story there. Oh, definitely. You know, it works. It, there are a few books that, that can hit all three at the same oh, thank time. thank you. Thanks. And this does. Um, I wish we could talk more about it, but, but unfortunately we can't. But well, thanks, Suzanne. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. And um, thank you for watching. Um, I've been talking with Paula Sicki, author of most recently Unbuilt Projects, and a new book that will be coming out as well soon. Yeah, The Narrow Door, uh, about a year from now. Fantastic. The Narrow Door. Um, and if you'd like to know more about our creative writing program here at Brookdale, please check us out online at www.brookdalecc.edu. We've got great classes offered and open to everybody. So thanks for watching. Yeah.